Today's episode is sponsored by Newspapers.com, the largest online newspaper archive. Newspapers.com makes it easy to find your family's story. With more than half a billion digitized newspaper pages from the 1690s to today. Search for obituaries, marriage announcements, birth announcements, photos, and more in papers from across the United States, the UK, Canada, and beyond, stretching back three generations. For listeners of this podcast, Newspapers.com is offering 20% off a Publisher Extra subscription. Just use the coupon code FAMILYTREEMAGAZINE at checkout. That's code FAMILYTREEMAGAZINE, all one word, for 20% off Publisher Extra. Welcome to the Family Tree Magazine podcast. My name is Melina Papadopoulos, and I am the digital editor here at Family Tree Magazine. This month, we are taking a brief break to celebrate the holiday season and trying something a little different from the traditional episode. Instead, we want to share some of our most memorable interviews of 2023. First, we will revisit Lisa Alzo's research plan, which is sure to help you prepare for the new year ahead. Then, we will revel in the holiday spirit with Denise May Levnick as she shares with us some excellent tips for preserving beloved family recipes and kitchenware. Finally, we will stop by the editor's desk for a year in review and genealogy with Family Tree Magazine's editor, Andrew Cook. We have lots to cover this month, and we wish all of our listeners a wonderful holiday season. Let's start by getting organized once more with the January 2023 episode in which Lisa Louise Cook interviews Lisa Alzo about creating a genealogy research plan. A research plan helps you record the who, what, when, where, and why of your family history quest. It's kind of your uh, genealogy GPS, if you will. So to help you map out your research plan, author Lisa Alzo is here to share her five steps for how to create a genealogy research plan. Welcome back to the show, Lisa. Hi, Lisa. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for being here. Loved your article. And I would love to have you take us through your five point strategy that you kind of lay out in that online article so that our listeners can use it as a model. Will you do that for us? Absolutely. So you are right that the research plan is just like a GPS for your genealogy research. It points you in the right direction. And I just want to stress that I think it's really important because most genealogists, you know, we go on our online databases or on Google and we just type names and just hope for the best. And while that can work sometimes, sometimes you get lucky and get information. I think it's always better to kind of have a plan on, you know, who you want to research and what exactly you want to find out. So first you want to establish a genealogy research objective. So you know, you don't want to just say, I want to find out about my, you know, paternal grandfather on my dad's side. You want to be specific. I want to find out where my grandfather was born or where my great grandfather was born or when did that ancestor immigrate to the United States. And so when you do this, you kind of set up long-term goals, like to find the, you know, exact date and when your great-grandfather left home uh, and the date he arrived in the United States. But then you might have a short-term objective, like to check the censuses for year of immigration. So 1900, 1910, 1920, 1930, etc. And then once you do that, you want to list any known facts. So you might have a family narrative or you know, something that a, a relative told you. And so you write down what you might already know or what you might think may be the case, but you don't want to blindly accept those those family uh, lores, those tales. You want to you know, always investigate the facts of those, but at least that serves as a guideline for you. And then you'll go through and form a working hypothesis. So, you know, basically say, you know, your great-grandfather left, for example, in my case, Slovakia at 
a certain time. So I know he left at this date and that he was in the United States between a certain period of time. And so I kind of write it out like just a, a paragraph, what I know and uh, as much as I know, and that's, that's covered in the article, an example is given. And then once I do that, I want to identify the sources that which records I want to seek. So obviously, you might seek a port of departure if that's available. You'll look for the passenger list when they arrived, and anything else that might establish when they arrived in the United States and when they settled. So like in my, my case, you know, I know there were some children that were born in the U.S., so I would look for, you know, a baptism or a birth record and, uh, you know, of course, other records that, that might help. So you'll look for your primary and secondary sources. And again, this is all covered in the article. And then you want to define the steps for accessing and using those resources. Are they available online in one of the databases, either Ancestry, MyHeritage, FamilySearch, or another database? Or do you have to write away to, say, a vital records office? Or do you have to obtain that information at a courthouse? And maybe you have to use email communication or mail or even go there in person. So you want to always, you know, where will I find this piece of information? And so you kind of write down the sources and how you seek to get them. And then you're just going to then follow through on your plan and then, of course, record your results either in your genealogy software program or if you do a research log using Excel spreadsheet or Word or some other tool that you like to record your results. And that basically is the five steps. I love it. So we have, uh, you had number one was to establish genealogy research objective which I totally agree. I mean, we think we kind of know it in our head, but when you really have to almost write it down and put it into words, it helps you really get specific and focused. And then number two, you said was list known ancestor facts. So what we know about them. Number three, form a working hypothesis. Number four was identify sources with related records, which is terrific, kind of starts a checklist for you. And then you wrapped it up with number five, which was define steps for accessing and using records. I love this process because it does, in a sense, kind of create a checklist for us. So we we can start checking things off and uh, recording everything. You mentioned lots of different avenues we might use to record our stuff. Do, what do you personally tend to do? Do you tend to do that in your database? Do you create Excel worksheets? What do you like? So generally, I like for my research log for recording information, I do favor the Excel spreadsheet because I can sort it by date or by record type or whatever. And it's pretty portable. I can always upload it to Google because it's compatible with the Google Sheets. And so it's always, you know, available online and it's easily, it's an easy method to record your information. And what I do then when I verify that information, that this is the person and this is the correct information, I analyze it, then I will put that into my genealogy software, you know, my database. Uh, so that's what I like, like for planning my research. Search. I'm a big Trello fan. I've written articles about that and I've done presentations on, on Trello because it's sort of a good boards, lists, and cards kind of way to plan out what you're going to do. And it's very visual, but there are many methods. People use all sorts of tools and there are so many that, that you can choose from, but those are the ones I tend to use most often. Well, and I think you're right that there's a wide variety. So what I guess this really gives us freedom to know that it's not so much which one you do, but that you do it, that you put it into action and you're consistent and you have kind of a framework for what you're trying to accomplish. And you've certainly provided a framework for everybody listening here in this article. It's available online. It's called How to Create a Genealogy Research Plan, a five-step example. This is a premium article, which is part of the membership available at FamilyTreeMagazine.com. And also, you know, at FamilyTreeMagazine.com, there are a lot of great free forms you can use, some of which will also help you with this research plan. So we'll have a link so that you can check out the free forms on the website as well. 
Lisa, tell folks where they can check you out online and all the other things that you're doing. Well, in addition to Family Tree Magazine and, of course, Family Tree University, I have a website and you can go to lisaalzo.com and that's where you can find me and uh, links to some of the other articles I've written and, you know, tools and things that I recommend. Sounds terrific. And that's Alzo, A-L-Z-O, LisaAlzo.com. Lisa, it's always good to talk to you. Thank you so much for sharing your research plan with us. Thank you, Lisa. And I wish everyone happy researching. As mentioned at the top of the show, this episode is sponsored by Newspapers.com. We've invited Jenny Ashcraft back to share with us how newspapers can be used to guide our genealogy research. So can you tell us what newspapers can reveal about our ancestors? Newspapers can reveal so many fun and exciting details about our ancestors. But one of the most obvious and perhaps the most valuable is location. If your ancestor is mentioned in the paper, they likely lived in that surrounding area at that time. I want to walk you through how I use newspapers to learn learn more about the life of one of my ancestors. Her name is Martha Weimer, and she lived in Indiana County, Pennsylvania her whole life, or so I thought. Searching newspapers.com, I learned that Martha's life was anything but ordinary. Martha was in the census in Pennsylvania in 1860, 1870, 1880, 1900, and 1910. And then she died in 1913 and is buried in Pennsylvania. So one might assume that she never left Pennsylvania. Well, newspapers showed me that that was actually wrong, and I was able to piece together an entirely different narrative of Martha's life. So Martha's husband, John Weimer, was a successful merchant in Indiana County, Pennsylvania. And sadly, he died in 1864, leaving Martha alone, a young widow with two small daughters. But fortunately, John willed Martha his estate. And her name appeared repeatedly in the newspapers over the years because she used that money to help family members. She donated property for a cemetery. She was constantly helping others in need in her community. Well, when Martha's oldest daughter married, as was customary then, Martha moved in with her and her new son-in-law. Well, Martha's son-in-law was a minister, and thanks to newspapers, I learned that the family moved to Colorado, Idaho, and even the Washington Territory, where he was a minister at different churches. So even though I thought Martha never left Pennsylvania, I soon discovered that she lived all over the country. Well, even though records seem to suggest that that your ancestor ancestor lived in one place for a long time, don't forget to broaden your newspaper search outside of their hometown, outside of the dates of their lifetime. You just may be surprised at what you learn. Thank you, Jenny. Can you also give us a tip or two for how to search newspapers.com for the best results? One of the best tips that I can share for using newspapers.com as a tool for your genealogy research is to try every combination of a person's name when you're searching for them in the papers. I'm a big fan of using quotation marks around a search term when I want to see results where just those weird words appear together. So let me give you an example. When I started searching for Martha Weimer, I went to the newspapers.com homepage and I searched for Martha J. Weimer in quotation marks, and I searched every paper in the country. Well, newspapers.com very quickly in a second or two returned 28 results, and every single one of them was for my ancestor. However, when I searched for Martha J. Weimer without quotation marks, I got more than 19,000 results. Well, if I would have stopped searching right then, I would have missed so much more. So I did 
additional searches and I searched for Martha Weimer with quotation marks around that. I searched Mrs. John Weimer in quotation marks. I searched Mrs. Weimer in quotation marks. Any variation of a name that you can think of. Um, perhaps there's um, initials in any any way that you can think of where your ancestor's name appeared. Try searching every variation that you can think of. Thank you so much, Jenny. And for all of our listeners out there looking to start headline hunting themselves, I'm happy to announce that we are offering a 20% off discount of a publisher's extra subscription to newspapers.com. And all you have to do is use the coupon code Family Tree Magazine when you check out. That's Family Tree Magazine, one word. Happy researching. With the holidays just around the corner, many of us are eager to share our favorite dishes with family. Back in February, Denise May Levinick offered some excellent tips for preserving recipes and kitchenware for years to come. In today's Family History Home segment, we're heading to the kitchen to explore and preserve our culinary history. Denise May Levinick has loads of ideas for us from her column that is in the January and February 2023 issue of Family Tree Magazine, and she's here today to tell us more about it. Welcome back to the podcast, Denise. Hi, Lisa. Thanks so much for having me here. Oh, well, thank you for being here. I love this topic of heirloom kitchenware because It reminds me of many happy hours in the kitchen with my mom and my grandmothers. Our pots and pans and our Tupperware is pretty nostalgic, isn't it? It sure is. A lot of us have kept little odd utensils or kitchen tools, and um, they just bring back such memories. Food can kind of be emotional, and then we're spending time with our our loved ones and our families. So, um, yeah, definitely gets us in that nostalgic mode. I was thinking about that many of us have things that were given to us, let's say when we first got married, and then we have stuff in our cupboards that uh, we've been buying over the years. So we have kind of a mix of old and new. What kinds of items should we be looking for, keeping an eye out for in our cupboards? I like to look for things that have a story and a memory attached and That's not really too hard. I think a lot of us will see something in our mother's or grandmother's cupboards, kitchens, and immediately that triggers a memory. I know my mom had a big bowl. It was the biggest bowl in our kitchen. And when I look at it now, it's not so huge. It was a kind of pottery, sort of an orangish color, Bauer, I think, was the pottery maker, and it had little ridges around it, and that was the bowl she always made chocolate chip cookies in, with a wooden spoon or a little hand mixer with the, you know, the two beaters that you would push on. Yes. And so when, after she passed away and my sister and I were clearing up her kitchen, I said, oh, I want this bowl. My sister said, well, fine, you can have it, (laughs) especially because it has a crack in it. But it's still okay. It still makes great chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> the crack is part of the character, isn't it? It is. It is. And it's. it just reminds me, too, that her chocolate chip cookies were not the ones on the back of the Toll House package. They were something different. And when I asked her about the recipe, she uh, sent it to me or gave me her cookbook or something. And it's kind of a Depression-era cookie. It has a lot of oatmeal in it. And it's not made with butter. It's made with uh, Crisco. So, (laughs) but it was good. (laughs) Yes. Oh, my gosh. You know, it's funny. You talk about items having stories. I have a, a cookie jar that I got from my grandmother on my father's side. And she was a, a absolute... I don't know, I'm a neat freak. She, she was very, very fastidious, very clean. She cleaned all the time. And it's so funny. I was talking to an antique dealer and I was showing them the cookie jar. And she's like, your grandmother was very, very uh, clean oriented. And wasn't she? I said, yes. How did you know that? And she's like, this cookie jar used to be fully painted. 
<laughs> she has scrubbed all the paint off this thing. Oh. And all what you have left is the ceramic. <laughs> and I thought, that is so funny because that is absolutely her story. So, of course, when she passed, um, I very much was excited to take that cookie jar home. Something else I think about is Tupperware. And here I was having the idea that it, Tupperware came around the 60s, but it was actually in the 40s. So most of us have had some exposure or at least have one Tupperware item in our kitchen. Is there anything that we can do to preserve or restore Tupperware? Oh my gosh, I just love Tupperware. My friends kind of <laughs> laughed at me as we got a little older. And, uh, and you know, I always had a secret desire to be a Tupperware lady. I thought it would be so <laughs> fun. Yeah. Yes. I just so social. I, I loved all these colorful containers. You know, they would get you organized because just having them would make you organized, right? <laughs> right. But um, you know, as as I still have a few pieces, I've kind of let some of it move on, but it gets sticky after a time. Uh, because maybe we don't keep it washed or it gets just dusty or whatever. But you can revive um, that sticky plastic by sort of washing it with a mixture of vinegar and water. I didn't know that until I did a little research. And use a little baking soda to scrub off stains if you need to. But it was wonderful stuff. <laughs> Oh, it was. And it came in so many forms and so many colors. And you're right. I mean, it was almost like a social event. Oh, when it the was. Tupperware lady would come to your house. It was. And remember the crazy little odd tools they would have? The gadgets that you would get when you went to yes. a Tupperware party. That was what oh, was wonderful. So fun. Well, now something else that many of us may have, um, maybe in the back of the, the cupboard, but it's there, is cast iron. I know I have one big old cast iron pan that's very old, and that can be preserved if you pay a little attention to it, can't it? Right. You never want to soak it in water, of course. Right. And mostly it just needs a, a quick rinse with some water or maybe to be wiped out with a damp paper towel. Of course, it depends on if you've seasoned it well. And for a lot of people who are real compulsive about cleaning, they don't really like cast iron because it can't get soaked and all that kind. Uh, it just needs to be seasoned with a light coating of oil. I was surprised to discover when uh, my mother-in-law passed away and we had an estate sale that her cast iron was highly collectible. I didn't know it until I found people fighting in the kitchen over th things. Some oh. of the frying pans. Yeah. It's definitely do worth doing a little research if you have some very old vintage cast iron and taking good care of it. Absolutely. And there, there's always going to be a certain amount of just wear and tear. We shouldn't be striving to necessarily try to bring it back to its original condition, right? That's part of the character. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's You want that patina on cast iron. That's how you know it was a good piece. It's got some, uh, you know, it's totally nonstick before we had Teflon. Yes. And wood items, you know, they have a lovely glow that like salad bowls and spoons and that kind of thing. Well, and that makes me think of utensils. I would think that utensils are some of the most common things that are still sitting in our drawers, even after, you know, different Tupperware pieces have made their way into the garbage or whatever. Oh, we, sure. we might still have that big wooden fork or spoon. Uh, any suggestions there for how we might preserve and care for those? Or rolling pin. That's something that's commonly yes. passed on. And I found a rolling pin in my grandmother's things that somebody had put a tag on that it belonged to the grandmother before. The wood is totally smooth by now. It's so old. And uh, with all wooden things, of course, like a little like cast iron, you don't want to soak them in water. Just give them a, a light cleaning and kind of polish them with a cloth because the patina is really lovely. You can use a little mineral oil to bring back some of the moisture in the wood if you need to. But I don't know. what What's your favorite kitchen tool? I bet you have one too. You know, it's funny. I have a little, I think you mentioned it, like it's like an egg beater. Oh yeah. Whisk. The circular handle and the two beaters are ro it's a rotating beater. Oh. And the beauty of it was, is when I just have fond memories of watching my grandmother use it, 
But two, when the power goes out, (laughs) I can still make stuff. You know what I mean? It's really interesting. Some things are not maybe as on a daily basis as practical or as efficient, but I still want them in my kitchen. So what I've been doing lately, Denise, is using them decoratively. And, you know, I I bought a wire basket at an antique store, hung it by the bottom of it onto the wall, and then started hanging some of these items and attaching them with wire so that they're on display. But, you know, when the power goes out, I might take one down and use it. That's a great idea. They're so fun to see and they bring back such fond memories. It's nice to have them out where you can enjoy them. Absolutely. Well, everybody, you need to get into your kitchen, start crawling around the back of the cupboards and see what you might have because it's all family history. And you can turn to Denise's article. It's in the January, February 2023 issue of Family Tree Magazine. Her family history home column appears there each issue. And in that particular issue, it's called Saving Heirloom Kitchenware. And she's got some great items there and some great advice. Always fun to talk to you, Denise. Thank you so much for uh, helping us out in the kitchen today. Oh, you're welcome. And thanks for inviting me to talk about really my favorite topic, kitchenware. (laughs) (laughs) And oh, I want to encourage everybody, go check out um, Denise's website and blog. She's got a few more articles on this topic. So it's thefamilycurator.com. Thanks again, Denise. Thanks. Bye-bye. Finally, we are headed to the editor's desk for a summary of 2023's Genealogy News with Family Tree Magazine's editor, Andrew Cook. I'm Andrew Cook, editor of Family Tree Magazine. For this episode's From the Editor's Desk segment, I wanted to walk you through the biggest genealogy headlines of 2023. I'll include links to more information about each story in the show notes. First up, we have new record releases. Perhaps the most prominent was the 1931 Census of Canada, which was released to the public in June. It was met with so much interest that Library and Archives Canada had to temporarily remove the record set, as its servers couldn't handle the surge in traffic. Stateside, two notable record digitization projects were announced. The Million Names Project from the New England Historic Genealogical Society seeks to recover the names of all African Americans who were enslaved in the modern United States. The project will create free-to-search databases of names extracted from historical documents, oral histories, and more. In addition, the National Genealogical Society announced the formal resumption of Preserve the Pensions. This project has been digitizing at-risk War of 1812 pension records since it was announced in 2008, and is a collaboration between NGS, the National Archives, and Ancestry.com. New records are being added to Fold3, where users can view them for free. Speaking of NGS, the Society merged this year with two prominent genealogy organizations, Conference Keeper, a website that collects information about genealogy-related events, and the Genealogical Research Institute of Pittsburgh, also known as GRIP, are now part of the NGS family. In the world of genetic genealogy, data breaches at two major websites prompted renewed calls for transparency and data security. In September, the owner of GEDmatch, a site that offers DNA analysis tools, disclosed that researchers exploited a glitch in its system to access the data even of people who had explicitly opted out of use by law enforcement. And in October, testing website 23andMe revealed that hackers breached its database and poached information on perhaps millions of users, publishing some of it on the dark web. Elsewhere in DNA testing, UK-based record site FindMyPast and testing company LivingDNA ended their partnership, and Ancestry DNA moved some of its tools behind a new subscription paywall. Ancestry also launched a new DNA test for pets, perfect if you've been curious about the history of your canine family members. Finally, the major genealogy websites continued to roll out new features this year. MyHeritage added a photo dater and a new scanning app called Reimagine to its suite of photo editing tools. And Ancestry.com has launched beta versions of several new or improved features, including a fan chart view for family trees, new messaging tools, and an updated user interface for its homepage. Ancestry also announced that its subsidiary website RootsWeb will become read-only in January. Some of RootsWeb's features have already been sunsetted. Woo! What a year it's been! I'll discuss 2023 news highlights in our last Genealogy Insider email newsletter of the year. See the show notes for a link to sign up for free. Happy holidays and enjoy the time you spend with your relatives this month. 
both living and deceased. Thank you so much for tuning in for 2023's final episode of the Family Tree Magazine podcast, the show from America's number one genealogy magazine. As always, I will include links to key resources mentioned in the, all the interviews in the show notes. You can find the show notes at familytreemagazine.com slash podcast. Familytreemagazine.com is also an excellent resource for finding many different genealogy tools, such as how-to guides, free downloads, and so much more. If you're listening to the show through a podcast app, like Google Podcasts or Apple, we would appreciate it very much if you left a five-star review for us. That way, other people can discover us and learn all they need to about genealogy research. Thank you again and have a wonderful holiday season.